and I work at a place called the John Innes Centre in Norwich. And where's that, you may wonder? Um, it's just here, it's northeast of London, about 200 kilometres, quite near the coast. So the place I actually work is this centre here. This is actually a, a group of institutes, now sometimes called the uh, Norwich Research Park or the Norwich Bio Institutes, which actually consists, this is the John, this is the building I actually work in. Um, and these are various other institutes. This is the, all the greenhouses for the plants. And this, it, wasn't, it was actually being built at the time, is now the Genome Analysis Centre for the National Centre for Non-Medical Genomics in the UK, is here. And over here is the Institute of Food Research, and this is the University of East Anglia, and there's a hospital now, and so it's, it's a big complex of Norwich Research Park, which is nice, NRP. Okay, so the virus I'm going to talk about is a thing called Cowpea mosaic virus. Now, it's a virus which is rather like an animal picorna virus. It's a spherical virus, um, which has typical two, three, and five-fold symmetry. It was first isolated about 50 years ago as a pathogen of tropical legumes, cowpeas. Cowpeas are otherwise known as black-eyed peas, black-eyed beans. Uh, you know, not just, it's not just a pop group. It's not just Fergie. And um, it infects legumes, a wide variety, including those, but also very usefully for us, this very rather easier and rapidly growing host called Nicotiana benthamiana, which is a sort of weedy relative of tobacco. It's not commercially grown. It reaches very high titers, and this, for this reason it attracted a lot of attention over the past 50 years in times when technology was not as well developed and you needed far more material to do crystallography, um, RNA studies. And the fact you can get up to a gram of particles per kilogram of plant material um, was very helpful for that, that kind of work. And the particles are very easy to purify and they're very stable, which is why it's attracted a lot of attention as a nanoparticle, um, which I'll come on to at the end of my talk and why that. So, I mean, it's stable up to 60 degrees centigrade and in 50% DMSO. So you can do a lot of modifications chemically afterwards. I don't think many animal viruses are quite that robust. Okay, so what does it really look like? This is a, an electromicrograph of the particles, purification uh, you'll get from a plant. If you separate uh, or, or centrifuge such a preparation on a, a gradient, you'll split it into three different bands called top, middle, and bottom, for obvious reasons. And in fact, what you'll find is that top... Um, bands just consist of empty protein shells, no nucleic acid. So you'll get natural empty capsids formed during infection. Usually no more than 10 to 15 percent of the preparation will be empty. And the, other, the middle and the bottom uh, particle uh, components contain either RNA2, a smaller RNA, um, or RNA1, which is the larger one. So these contain, these are the nuclear protein components. And RNA1 is about three and a half kilobases long and uh, encodes the coat proteins, and they're two types, large and small, although the large coat protein has two distinct domains. So actually, it's rather like having three domains, and the N and the C terminal are like uh, VP2 and VP3 of a coronavirus, and this is like a separate VP1. It's just actually that one of the proteolytic processing reactions of a coronavirus doesn't occur in these. Um, and RNA1 is a bit bigger, it's about six kilobases and encodes all the machinery that the virus makes to enable its RNA to replicate. So it would be like a P2 and P3 region of a picorna virus, and this would be like the P1 region. Um, this thing called Mark Pro is equivalent to 3C. It's called 24K protease in this case, and it's responsible for processing the polyproteins of both RNA1 and RNA2. Um, so basically, this is like a P1 region with the coat proteins. Also, this protein, this pair of proteins up here involved in cell-to-cell -cell movement through plasmatosmata. So these are the structural proteins. These are the cat catalytic proteins, as it were. Um, and this actually RNA will m amplify itself in individual plant cells. But it won't be able to spread because it makes no coat protein or none of the cell-to-cell -cell spread protein. And you need both RNAs or a mixture of these two particles um, are required for an infection on plants. Um, but you will get this replication on RNA1 on its own. And the expression of genes is by polyproteins and their subsequent processing by a protease. Okay, so how do we actually manipulate this virus for practical work? 
Well, what we use is a technique called agroinfiltration. And I will explain this a bit because it has no equivalent in, plant, in animal virology or bacterial virology. Basically, you make... This is, the first bit will be fairly um, familiar. You just make a full-length copy of RNA1 and a full-length copy of RNA2, and you put those downstream of a plant-specific promoter. This is a 35S promoter from cauliflower mosaic virus, so it's a plant promoter. So these double-stranded DNA copies will be transcribed into RNA once they get into the plant cell, and you have a NOS, nopaline synthetase terminator, at the end, so the RNA knows when to stop. And that's so f much so familiar. But what you don't have to do is purify plasma DNA. You can actually just inject the bacteria into the leaves of the plant. And I have a film here, which I don't know if it's going to link, to show it really is a simple... Oh, that should be working. That's working now. This really should be... As, it is as simple as it seems. In fact, I think it's too simple. It shouldn't really work, but it does work extremely well. So here's a plant. This is actually a cowpea plant. This is just a syringe without a, a needle. And that's a, a, a suspension of agrobacterium containing the plasmids. And you simply damage the surface of the leaf and then push the air out. And the liquid flows under the epidermis. And all those cells in contact with the liquid, I think uh, Francesca's done this, <laughs> um, and will have the DNA delivered to them. And if that's an infectious clone, that will then become infected and the virus will spread throughout the, the plant. And that's um, the, the amusement we can have with these kind of things. Um, okay, so how can we actually use this as a kind of expression system? Well, that's not the way we deliver the genes. Well, the very first way we did this was to actually just take RNA2 and add an extra gene to it. And as always with this kind of studies, you start with GFP because it's... If it doesn't work with GFP, it won't work with anything. Um, and so we just added an extra gene to RNA2, made it a bit longer, and we released the GFP by including a 2A catalytic peptide, which gives co-translational processing at this site, cleavage site here. And you take this slightly larger RNA1, uh, RNA2 sorry, and co-inoculate with RNA1. And that's just wild-type RNA1 to provide the replication functions. And if you do that, what will happen and this is done oh, about 12, 13 years ago, you'll find that you'll get this... Here's this RNA2. There's RNA1 um, in there as well. This will replicate, and the GFP expression will spread throughout the plant. This will have been originally inoculated at one of the leaves down below. So you've got a fully infectious virus making GFP. Well, that's uh, very nice. And this kind of technology is used actually widely to follow the spread of viruses around plants, how they move. Again, very the equivalent to work done on other systems. Of course, you don't just want to express GFP. You have to want to check whether this kind of thing works with other things. So you replace the sequence of GFP with proteins of interest. And one of the first ones we used was these SIPs, small immune proteins, kindly donated by uh, Oscar Baroni and... Uh, Marco Bestagno, as part of an EU project we had together um, in the mid-2000s. Um, and as a result of that work, we showed that you could actually express these small immune proteins, make a sort of cowpea soup, so no purification of the SIPs, and feed those to piglets in collaboration with a group in Madrid, and showed that you could actually give passive immunization of piglets against challenge with transmissible gastroenteritis virus. So these proved that actually plant-expressed mini-antibodies in this case, were fully active against a disease. And in a theory, could provide a, a way of you know, immunizing animals with just a, 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 a rather crude preparation. Um, around the same time, uh, we did some work with hepatitis B core antigen and showed that you could get particles of hepatitis B. And that all looked very promising with these replicating vectors. But we quickly realized there was going to be a problem. And... The disadvantages are there's a limit of about a kilobase, so about the size of a SIP gene. Um, on the size of foreign gene, you can insert to give a stable construct. If you try to put a bit more in, as soon as it started replicating, you started losing bits of it. You get deletions, and it became really rather unusable. And again, I'm sure that's familiar to people working with replicating animal virus vectors. 
the infections result in viruses which can spread to other plants, which is in some ways part of the attraction. You could actually, if you wanted more material, just take some sap and inoculate more plants. But it means it raises problems of biocontainment. These can actually spread to other plants and could spread in the environment if they got out. Um, and a, a third one which became apparent is that when you have replicating systems, you get a phenomenon which is quite interesting and, and rather ill understood of virus exclusion. That as the virus spreads, if you try and express two different, say RNA2, say with a heavy and a light chain of an antibody, um, you tend to get cells expressing one or the other. Once one gets, get, gets started in, in one cell, it tends to dominate one or the other. And that's not what you want because you won't get assembly of an active complex that way. So it's very difficult to make multimeric proteins with these kind of vectors. So what we d decided to do is can we create a defective version to try and cure this problem? Um, so what we wanted to do was to make use of some studies which had been done some years before. We said, well, with RNA2, it depends on RNA1 for its replication. It won't do anything on its own. It encodes the structural proteins. Well, if we don't need the spread and we don't need the coat proteins, maybe we can just eliminate all those and just leave those sequences which could still be recognized by the RNA1 replication complex. And that wouldn't be able to spread in the environment. You wouldn't get any particles and uh, would be biocontained. And so what you would then do is insert a foreign gene, and of course you start with GFP, as you always do, and assess the ability of the constructs to be replicated by RNA1 when co-inoculated into leaves using that um, method of agroinfiltration. But what we found we had to do was to add a suppressor of silencing, because it turned out something we didn't suspect was that the small coat protein of CPMV, which we've eliminated, actually is the natural suppressor of gene silencing, which the virus uses to counteract uh, the host defense against virus infection. And so having removed the natural one, we have to put another one back, and we use a, a heterologous one, a thing called P19, from a different plant virus. And if you do that, you uh, will get a situation like this, basically what we do. Here we have this slightly odd situation at the 5' prime UTR, where we have some upstream AUGs. The main initiation codon is at 512. So we position the gene we want to express here. We have to leave this rather complex arrangement intact, otherwise you don't get replication. And you need the three-primed UTR for, re for recognition. And you put in your sequence of GFP here. And we, this concept was the first one, one GFP. And then you agroinfiltrate RNA2 into this host, Nicotiana benthamiana, in the presence of RNA1 with the suppressor. And see if you can, um, this will actually work and then replicate and express. And lo and behold, what happens here is this is a bit, if you just have the one GFP on its own, so no replication, no suppressor, this is where we've damaged the, the benthamiana leaves. And you can actually just about see the infiltrated area, a little bit of GFP expression. If you add the RNA1 for replication and the suppressor of gene silencing, do the same thing and see a, a big enhancement of, of expression. So we're very happy with that um, and uh, have gone ahead and, and used that, that, this system and one of the first things, this is actually a different suppressor, have made hepatitis B core particles just by making, replacing GFP with a hepatitis B core antigen sequence. And you'll get these very nice looking hepatitis B core particles out of the, out of the plants in, in large amounts. And, in, um, and uh, you can purify them to a degree. And of course, again, hepatitis B core antigens are quite easy to work with because they're very stable. Um, but also they have to have use you know, as ways of presenting antigens and epitopes. And in collaboration with um, a, a, a small biotech company, or actually getting larger biotech company in, in Canada called Medicargo, um, we showed actually that you could replicate two deleted versions of RNA2, because these won't move and segregate, because they, they're, they're, they're deleted. And so you can do a, a, one expressing the heavy chain, one expressing the light chain, and actually, you can express them together. I mean, it's not the nicest of gels, but you can get high levels of fully assembled. This is full-size IgGs, quite nice. And you get levels up to 74 milligrams per kilogram of leaf tissue, which I thought was pretty respectable. Um, that's when you retain the antibodies in the endoplasmic reticulum. So we were quite happy with that. But then we noticed a, a phenomenon that 
Now, I can't quite remember. This must have been just done as a control by a PhD student, Frank Sainsbury, um, as part of his, the kind of things you do when you're writing a thesis, preparing a thesis. You do all the extra things, because the kind of thing which will appear. And what you found was that, yes, if you co-infiltrate with RNA1, it does lead to replication. That was proven. Um, and you can, you can see the negative strands. However, if you use a powerful suppressor of silencing, such as P19, actually having replication doesn't add that much. You stabilize the RNA so much that just having linear synthesis off the template DNA, the RNA will last so long, you'll get high levels of production without the need for the replication. And so this is just without the RNA1. Again, you're getting these very high levels of synthesis of the, just the one GFP construct without replication, but with the suppressor in the inoculated area. And therefore, we thought, well, do we actually need to retain the ability of RNA2 to be replicated if it's not necessary? Um, and if you remember in the previous slide, there was that slightly complicated arrangement of initiation codons around the five-primed UTR, which was needed to preserve replication. That made cloning a bit of a nuisance, having to position stuff exactly in relation to that. And so we thought, well, if you don't need replication, maybe we can actually just uh, uh, abolish that kind of, uh, um, those AUGs and make it simpler, just make our lives simpler. And my thought, if we tried that, was, um, would be that uh, we'd probably make the translation worse <laughs> as well, because that's usually what happens. Um, anyway, we, uh, Frank says we tried this. And we removed, this is the various upstream AUGs. This is one outer phase. This is one in phase. If you make these deletions, you will stop replication. That was known. But what we observed here, here's our original construct expressing GFP, this one thing, one GFP, which in theory could be replicated, although there's no RNA1 here. And this is the GFP levels you get, and that's the fluorescence. If you remove the upstream, um, one of the upstream AUGs was out of phase with the main one, you do do a little bit of harm. You get less expression. But if you remove the in-phase one upstream and remove both of them, you get massively enhanced levels of synthesis without any replication, just in the inoculated area. Um, in fact, I mean, it was so striking when we first saw this that actually when you know, normally, you, I was used to, you go, if anyone's looked at a plant expressing GFP, um, the leaves fluoresce uh, are red due to chlorophyll fluorescence and you'll get the green background. And sometimes you have to try and convince yourself you can see some green. In fact, this was so extreme that the whole room was just bathed in green light. It was really quite extraordinary. You're in a green room, a green fluorescent room off a, off a few leaves. It was really quite, quite remarkable to see. Um, so you're getting, I mean, this is very, that's actually much too low. It's, it's nearly two grams per kilogram of GFP. So huge amounts without any replication. And you can actually look at the yields, what you've done here. Um, you can see this is the wild, that's our original one, which we were so proud of to start with, which is replication complex. We, knock, we take out the outer phase AEG and it does go down, and then you get these huge boosts with the in phase one now. Now, we looked into why this worked, what have we actually done here? And our immediate thought was, well, maybe it's, um, we've made it hyper-translatable, but there was a, a, another possibility that somehow we'd made the RNA much more stable, so it wasn't being turned over, and maybe we were somehow getting vastly increased RNA levels. But that actually turns out not to be the case, because if you do qPCR on looking at uh, RNA levels, you find all those constructs here have exactly the same levels of RNA. So this is really a translation effect that we've, we've, we've hit upon. And uh, we've called it, because it's hypertranslation, we call it CPMVHT, hypertrans. So that was very um, interesting for us. Um, but again, because we came across it, came upon it in a rather unexpected way, it wasn't something planned. The vectors we originally used, the backbone for the transient expression, the binary vectors were traditional transformation vectors, which are really quite large, about 14 kilobases, the vector backbone, low copy number, quite difficult to work with, lots of restriction sites you don't want. So I have to say, two students, uh, Ava Tuneman and, and Frank Sainsbury, immediately seeing what was needed, they just set to and designed a way of removing all the unnecessary sequences and made these wonderful vectors called the PEAK vectors, which stands for P, easy, and quick. <laughs> and uh, basically, between the right and left borders of um, 
which is needed for tDNA transfer, you actually have a cassette with the modified 5' prime UTR, which is hypertranslatable, a polylinker or a gateway cassette, or you could use other cloning systems, and then the 3' prime UTR. And also, you put the P19, the suppressive silencing, on the same tDNA. And that just makes the infiltration that much more efficient. And actually, for other purposes, we also have a selection marker, which is useful if you want to use this in a transgenic context. And these are quite small now. The whole thing with GFP in is about 7 um, kilobases. Very user-friendly. And actually, they've, they've modified it even further that you can put his tags on automatically. So they're very straightforward to use vectors. And they allow simple one-step cloning into a, a small binary vector, very easy to use. The, the important part, it has a modular design. And actually, it means you can line up more than one of these cassettes, these translation cassettes, on the same tDNA. So you can put multiple proteins from the same tDNA, which ensures you deliver all the constructs to every cell. That, of course, you can, you know, it's great if you, there's some work we've been doing recently on reconstructing metabolic pathways using that. And uh, you can adapt, I won't go into this, but you can ad um, adapt the system for stable transformation as well as transient expression. So you can actually modify the P19 so it's not as strong, um, which you, you have to do to get um, regeneration. So the advantage of this, well, you get very high levels of expression within a few days. So the whole experiment from inoculation, you'd harvest within five, six days. So it's all over and done with. You get your failures quickly, which is also quite useful. <laughs> you know what's not going to work. The system does not rely on replication. So this is not a replicative system. So there's no problems of size constraints, genetic drift with RNAs amplifying, and there's no problem of virus exclusion. They don't compete with each other in this case. Therefore, the system is suitable for the co-expression of multiple proteins within the same cell, and that. And by changing the sequence of the 5' prime UTR, you can modulate the translational efficiency of each gene. So there may be cases like, say, an antibody, an IgG, where you want exact stoichiometry, you know, one to one of heavy and light chain. But there are more complex proteins, which I'll talk about, where you don't want that, and you want less of one and more of another. And you can do that by altering the translational efficiency. Okay, so what are kind of success successes? Well, you can uh, do some rather basic things, and this is just another marker gene, in this case DS red, just infiltrated using um, a syringe around this area, and that's the area which is infiltrated, that's the DS red, and that's the sample from the uninfiltrated area. So you get huge amounts of protein made. And this is total protein, I mean, it's not been purified at all. This is do two co proteins, which I mentioned already. This is an IgG, a thing called 2G12, an anti HIV antibody. You just co-infiltrate with constructs with heavy and light chain. And these are the, after a single step purification on protein A, cephalose, you can actually just get these pure antibodies out. Four proteins, I'll talk a little bit more about these two examples. This is actually four proteins co-expressed to make blue tongue virus particles. And you can actually, not, these are all structural proteins, but you can actually express active enzymes. So this is human gastric lipase which we have because there's our sister institute at food research does a lot of work on digestion and they want a source of human gastric lipase which has the right pH optimum. Okay, a little bit more about anti-HIV 2G12. Well, it's a human anti-HIV IG, um, IgG which has been touted as a uh, way of preventing transmission of HIV, topical application. And people have worked out various inhibitory concentrations. This is for CHO cell produced material. People have produced this in transgenic tobacco. Actually, the inhibitory concentration is slightly lower. That's probably because there are more dimers there. And some work has also been done, although it hasn't been taken that far, in maize kernels. Because the idea is you could produce a lot of this material and then use it as a, to prevent um, transmission. And this just shows, it, well, it shows one of the gels I showed before. The expression of the um, IgG and the heavy and the light chains in various different conformations, whether we retained in the ER or secreted. And basically, you can do binding, you can do uh, look at glycosylation. Now, you'll get glycosylation if you secrete the protein. The glycosylation sites are the same, but you get the incorporation of somewhat different glycans. So you'll get fucose and xylose in the case of a plant. You'll get the high mannose forms if you retain in the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, 
But uh, so there are some some issues there, but uh, not so much for topical application there. And here you, here you can look at the uh, IC50s of the CHO produced stuff. And actually, for a lot of these, um, our, our plant produced stuff, it's very similar. This one's a little bit higher, but we don't think that's actually of any great significance um, because it's still in the microgram range. So, similar, these are fully active, fully neutralizing antibodies produced within a few days in infiltrated plants. Okay, so to get even more complicated, blue tongue virus. Now, this might be somewhat familiar because people working on rotavirus because they're, they're obviously in the same family. Um, so, to to get a, a proper virus-like protein, you actually need four different pro structural proteins. And why would you want to produce such a thing? Well, there's a big demand for it when BTV, which has always been around in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and also in the Mediterranean area, finally moved into the UK in 2007. And the vaccines produced in South Africa are attenuated um, vaccines, live attenuated, which actually cause the full disease if administered to cattle in, in northern Europe. So you, you can't actually apply them because they're naive animals in, in northern Europe. So that, that, you, you could, that the existing vaccines couldn't be used. So there are four main structural proteins, and it's complicated because there are 120 copies of uh, this 100 kilodalton VP3, which forms a subcore. On top of that, you get trimers, 780 copies of this 39 kilodalton protein, and these will assemble into these core-like particles. There's a subcore, and there's VP7 on top. These are very stable particles, um, about 70 nanometers in diameter, and they have a spiked structure. And they're very highly conserved among all the different serotypes of BTV. These things are not very immunogenic, though. So they, although they be, might be quite simple to produce, they're not an ideal basis for a vaccine. If you want to look a bit further, you've got your core-like particle. You have to put extra things on the surface, VP5 and VP2. Again, I always get confused when talking between blue tongue virus and rotavirus because the numbers are all different because it's just the order they run in the gel. So uh, I don't know. I can never remember which is equivalent to which, but it's, so I won't try. Um, and then you also get VP2, and these form these things called triskelion structures on the surface like this and these things here. And these are pH sensitive, they're bigger, not surprisingly, and they are highly immunogenic, and they give the serotypes. So what you really want to do to get, make a protective vaccine is um, these things. So it's a triple layered structure. So how can you do that? Well, one approach is we tried various formats, or Ava Tuneman tried various formats. Basically, you can put, make four separate constructs for each of the structural proteins and just mix the um, bacterial suspensions together and syringe them all in. It's the most basic way of doing it. Or, you can, but that, you may get some proteins in one cell and not in the other, but it's very flexible. You can alter things. Or you can put all four proteins on the same tDNA and line them all up and everything will come to every cell, but it's a bit of a pig to do the cloning that way and it's very unflexible if you want to make a change. And the best thing which worked out was to make, use two constructs one encoding the two uh, core proteins, VP3 and VP7, and one encoding VP2 and VP5, the outer proteins. And you could co-express those. That, that seemed to work the best. It seemed to combine efficiency and flexibility. And so all you do is you take the, the peak constructs for the core proteins and you agar-infiltrate them into benthymiana either on their own or with the construct encoding the outer protein. You extract the proteins and run them on, in this case, iodixonal gradients, which is a common density medium. And what you'll find here is that here's our core particles. This is just VP3 and VP7, where these are co-sedimenting together on an iodixonal gradient. This is just crude plant extract, by the way. So, and this is just all the, all the good. This is a lot of. This is um, the most abundant protein in the world, Rubisco, the two subunits, and that just stays at the top. And you just get the core-like particles down here. And if you put all four together, you'll get all four co-sedimenting. You'll actually see something here. The, the, the aficionados of these viruses will notice it's probably an overrepresentation of VP3. Um, and actually, that's where you can use this business of altering the translational efficiency by down-regulating VP3 synthesis and, 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 and addressing that problem. 
and you get about 100 migs of assembled particles per kilogram of wet leaf tissue. And if you look at these in the uh, EM, this is just natural BTV. This is some work from Polly Roy on baculovirus expressed BTV particles. And this is our plant produced material. These are fully assembled virus like particles, but there's this little bit of a mixture of some core like particles in amongst them. And that's because there is an over representation of VP3. As I say, you can down regulate that and drive the equilibrium towards the fully assembled ones and then purify them. And so, Having taken this material, we, we sent this plant-produced VLPs to South Africa, to colleagues in Cape Town and in Pretoria for immunological testing, because we don't have facilities in the Plant Institute. And they, did the, they wanted to do the immunology in sheep to go for the tar target animal. And so the details are not, not so um, important. This is the final preparation where we've down-regulated VP3, and you can see there are no core-like particles anymore and you just uh, in inoculate it into sheep in these experiments, and the, the details are not that important. But what, basically what you can find is that you, the sheep sera convert to produce antibodies against um, uh, the, the proteins you've injected, and uh, you can see all four uh, capsid proteins, and the transiently expressed BTV8s can be produced in large amounts and stimulate a positive immune response in sheep. Since that time, Challenge experiments have been done, and the sheep are protected against challenge with BTV. So this is a, a true experimental vaccine in a target animal. So now we're looking at ways of scaling up the production for, for this. OK, so can you do this? What happens with commercialization? Well, there's a co this co company, again, called Medicargo, who I mentioned with the early antibody work. They're based in Quebec City, and they started using our technology to produce hemagglutinin from influenza virus. Uh, and they've started with both seasonal flu and avian flu. And the first one they started was H5N1, which is the avian. And they actually uh, received, in November 2010, regulatory approval and phase two clinical testing of the avian flu. And that's quite a challenge if you're working with a plant-produced material, because there's no history. And so you have to go through, you know, the, the regulatory authorities, you know, say, what's this? <laughs> you know, sort of, and, you know, what kind of questions do you ask? They, they will invariably ask about viral contamination as if it's from an animal cell. But, of course, it's not really quite as relevant because it'll only be a plant virus. But uh, so that's quite a challenge. Um, on the third, middle of last year, they got positive results from phase two. And last year they commenced operations, commercial operations for large-scale production at their vaccine facility in North Carolina. And uh, that's designed to turn out 10 million doses per month of uh, HIV, which is still not enough, of course, for the demand for the HIV vaccine. But, you know, it's a way it's funded by DARPA, which is a sort of military funding. So it, it's badged as a sort of uh, um, a response to some kind of outbreak. Um, but if that's successful, we would hope to be able to go even further and to see if that works. And this was all done using the technology under license. So you can commercialize. What I should say is that if you commercialize, um, let's go back a bit, um, you say, can you imagine people with syringes going around? You know, sort of no, you don't have to do that. As an alternative, you can actually take whole plants and put them in a soup of agrobacterium upside down and just reduce the pressure. And that effectively sucks the air out of the intercellular spaces and allows the liquid to go in. And then you can take the plants out again, and they're fine, a bit waterlogged at first, and they'll continue to grow. And so you can industrialize this process with tons. You know, they, have, they now have, their facility has, you know, banks of automatic um, trays of benthamiana which is grow growing, and they get moved around until they eventually come to a door at the end where waiting for them is the vat of agrobacterium. They're then infiltrated and moved into the next stage, so it's all automated. So uh, um, vacuum infiltration is the way to scale things up. So, okay, and we, we, did it on, we do it on a slightly smaller scale in just an ordinary vacuum desiccator. You can just do it in your lab as well. Okay, so... What's the application to nanotechnology? I mentioned vaccines and antibodies. So nanotechnology. Well, CPMV, here's our, our structure again with the 60 copies of the small and the large coat protein. 
the small coat proteins around the five-fold axis. Basically, this is the asymmetric unit. Now, I mentioned that this is the large coat protein with two domains, both a beta barrel, and here's a small coat protein with a single domain. Now, this virus has been worked on as a nanoparticle for quite a few years, partly at the John Innes, but partly at the Scripps Research Institute in the US. Because the particles are so stable, the crystallographic structure is known, and you can get such large amounts. There's been a lot of work about modifying the surface of the particles. So we originally, I mean, years ago, um, 20 years ago now, I guess, we showed that you could actually genetically modify the outer surface by inserting small epitopes and grow the, the modified virus in plants. Because it's so stable in organic solvents and, and heat, you can chemically attach all sorts of moieties to the surface. Organometallic compounds, you can all sorts of things. So you can make electroactive nanoparticles with ferrocenes around the outside. Uh, that's been done. You can incorporate the virus particles into permeable multi-layer arrays um, and the idea of getting you know, uh, biosensors. Uh, and you can, it can serve as a template for mineralization and metallization. So you can coat the outer surface with metals. And you're basically using the vial particle as a template to get very precise sizes of, of, of nanoparticles, metallic nanoparticles, which are maybe conducting. And these are all sorts of applications, potentially in nanomaterials, nanoelectronics, and all these things, including biomedicine. And a particular interest of people, say, in Scripps, and a former student of mine is now Case Western, is in bioimaging, if you can make contrast reagents based on them. OK, so here you have the idea. So here's the particle with, it, with all the stuff on the outside. Now, all this stuff has been done with particles isolated from infected plant material just growing the virus. And that's fine, because you get a lot of material that way. But there are problems. If you're going to make genetic changes on the surface, there are very limited number of changes you can make before you destroy the ability of the virus to assemble anymore. Because it has to actually act as a, as a proper virus and be able to move from cell to cell. And so you're rather restricted in what you can do genetically. The particles also contain, or 90% of them, contain viral nucleic acid and are therefore infectious. So you're dealing with all this material. It could cause a disease not to humans or animals, but to other plants. And regulatory agencies don't like that idea of you shipping that material around. Also, the presence of viral RNA inside the particles means there's no room to put anything. So one aim of nanotechnology is to use nanoparticles to encapsulate material. Well, these particles are actually full of stuff already, nucleic acid, and you there's no in vitro disassembly assembly system with CPMV. Thus, the particles can't be loaded because they're full of RNA. So how can you get around this? Well, the solution, we thought, was maybe we could use our CPMV-based HT expression system to get around this problem and make synthetic um, nanoparticles based on CPMV. So we could actually make use of all the knowledge of how you can modify the surface without having this problem of RNA. And so the advantage of these empty ones are, I call them EVLPs, because as you'll see, they are genuinely empty. They don't have host nucleic acid in them either. They are non-infectious, okay, so regulatory um, authorities have no comment on them in terms of disease. Then The fact that they're empty means you can potentially load them, they don't have to be functional in a biological sense. They don't have to move from cell to cell. They've got to assemble still, obviously. But you, you've got far more choice. They don't have to interact with the cells in the same way. So you can make more radical genetic changes, and therefore you open up the possibilities of, of new uses. So what do you do to do this? Well, to make these EVLPs, you need a source of the coat protein. Now, the immediate precursor, which would be equivalent of P1 of a picornavirus, is this thing called VP60 which is a fused copy of the large and the small coat protein. Um, and you'll need to express that. But you also need to express the enzyme used to process it. Because this thing on its own, if you express, is completely insoluble and makes nothing recognizable. You have to express the proteinase, which is equivalent to 3C, and that comes from RNA1. And you put them both in a cassette under the HT. We thought at first maybe we wouldn't need as much as this and you know, wouldn't need the hypertranslational effect, but actually it turns out you're better off with it. And actually the best way of doing it is putting both these things on the same tDNA, 
Again, here's our P19 suppressor of silencing. The two cassettes are there. You infiltrate this into plants, and what you see is you get processed coat proteins. Here, wild type um, particles. You see you get some natural empties in there. And empty virus-like particles look the same to the first look on a, on a negative stained um, uh, TEM image. However, uh, that's not really quite good enough. So we wanted to look at a bit more detail. And so in collaboration with two colleagues at the University of Leeds in the north of England, um, did some cryo-electron microscopy where you can take, this is just a wild type virus, and actually just by freezing in, in here, you can actually see the two types of particles. So you can see the empty ones, the natural empty ones here and here, and these are the ones which contain RNA, just by examining. And here you take our empty ones, and they all appear to be empty, which is good, but that's not really why you do cryo -M. What you want to do is reconstruct the, um, the pictures. And so this is, if you do the reconstruction, of the wild type particles, you'll get the nice detailed shape of the outer part of the particle. And if you do a, a cross section through it, you can see you get the, the protein shell and the thing is full of material. Now that's RNA, but you can't resolve it in any detail at this resolution. Um, if you do the, exactly the same with the empty particles, it looks identical from the outside. So you haven't, you've made really authentic looking shells, but they are completely empty inside. And so you can actually also see this thing is not an artifact, that little point there. That's a pore at the five-fold axis, which gives you a potential way of loading these particles. And here's, this is actually from the, the crystallographic structure of the whole virus. And you can see in more detail, this is the five-fold axis, and this is about eight angstroms apart in diameter. So you could get small molecules in that way. So to show you can actually do this, and this might be of, of some um, value, um, another student, Ala Al-Jabali, who's now moved to Oxford, basically took our empty particles, soaked them in cobalt chloride, so those ions were small enough to penetrate, and then washed them and treated them with so sodium borohydride, which reduces the, uh, the cobalt ions to metallic cobalt. And actually, these are unstained particles. If you put them on the EM, you can actually see, well, yes, the contrast, because they contain the metal. You can actually see inside the particles is this metal. And although you don't have to take my word for this, what you can actually do is you can prove the metal is inside, because you can still detect the coat proteins with antibodies on the outside. And in fact, you can strip off the coat proteins and just get, be left with the metal. So now you've got a, a, a metal sphere which you can then use for any purpose you might wish, um, if, if you can think of a, a use for a small um, cobalt sphere. Um, now, cobalt was chosen simply because it's a very easy reaction to do. Um, what we're more interested in is using loading particles with iron oxide, which is paramagnetic. And so the idea is to take the iron, do a reaction to get the iron oxide within the particles, and then using the known, unknown ability to chemically modify the outer surface of the, the virus particles, um, this is, uh, you can actually put a targeting agent around the outside. This is just shown, this is just biotin, as you recognize it. So the idea is maybe you could load a particle with this paramagnetic material and then put a targeting agent, say, which would say target an integrin on a cancer cell or have something like folic acid on the outside, which is also would target to a cancerous cell, and then use this technique called uh, magnetic field hypothermia, where basically if you pass a magnetic field over a metallic particle of a certain size, it will heat up. And you don't have to go many degrees until you'll actually kill a cell, only a few degrees of rising temperature. So what you would hope to do is be able to inject these targeted nanoparticles into a patient they would bind just specifically to the cancerous cells. And the good thing is it wouldn't have to be a solid tumor. These could be individual cells in a, something like a leukemia. And you, all you'd have to do is pass a magnetic field over the person. And though just those cells would heat up and be killed. Of course, there's a lot of trials to do in, in this kind of work um, to get it to actually be a, a, a therapy. But uh, uh, that's the kind of uh, potential use of these loadable particles. And of course, other particles are used as well. It's not just CPMV but these have the right size and the right properties. So I hope just to wind up at this, um, 
And uh, it's just to say that we've come a long way in a short time. And I'm thinking particularly of the work since we discovered the actual, this hypertranslation effect um, and, and went away from replicating viral vectors. And I just, I had to look this up just recently. And this is actually, you've seen the gel already, I think, on, on the slide. This is actually the, the original page from a PhD student's notebook. This is Frank Sainsbury's notebook. Um, and this was on the 16th of September, uh, 2007. So it's not very long ago. It's less than five years. And when I wanted to photograph this, I wasn't sure what he'd have written, because he was an Australian, and he used rather colorful language. And I was a bit afraid there might be some, some you know, positive but obscene comments <laughs> that I wouldn't be able to, but simply, well, I think it's rather sweet. He actually said, simply wow, when he saw it. And we, it even gets me in there, and we estimate, and, and it says all this from a five-day wait on a first go. So any PhD student who's having trouble and worrying how things might go, and things are going slowly, suddenly things can go very quickly. So you get everything in five days. And so from the 16th of September 2007 to the 13th of September, four, four years later, this is the production facility of Medicargo in North Carolina for turning out the influenza virus vaccines. So that was in only four years we went in, in, in that time. So things can go quickly. When, when, I think what I'd say is you could say there's an awful lot of luck um, actually finding the phenomenon. But the thing to do is, the only bit of advice I would have is, if you think you've got something good, is to go with it and, and, and to follow it. And uh, it just remains for me to th thank all the people who've worked on the, the aspects I've, I've really talked about in here. This is my group who were at a meeting in Porto last, uh, last summer, sampling the local produce, as you would. And this is myself and Frank Sainsbury in the, the pilot production facility in uh, Quebec City at Medicargo a year or so ago. Okay, and it just remains for me to thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Oh, of course, we have funding from the um, John Innes, from the Research Council, and most recently from a Framework 7 program, Club Rover, which has just ended. So thanks very much.